Okay, welcome back. So you have to, before the seminar by Nobel Prize, you have to tolerate my presence still for one hour. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, this is the plan for the third and last lecture. Um, so starting from what we tried to address this morning, which is the calibration of the Alamas function, we will try to make some step forward uh, toward the derivation of cosmological constraints from you know, the statistics or the evolution of the population of galaxy clusters. So we will touch on different points in this item 3.1, which is, so from, I just give this title, from mass measurement to cosmological constraints. So we'll try to address the systematics that we have in the measurement of mass in, uh, of galaxy clusters using both simulations and ultimately observational data. Never forget that simulations can provide useful guidelines, but the final word will always be given by observational data, okay? Uh, never forget that. And uh, I will try to give at least one example, depending on how, how, how fast I can go, and uh, you know, since we have a sharp time constraint, um, I would like to give one example of other cosmological application galaxy class, and then I would like to spend a few words about the future, because you, you, know, you, you will be concerned about the future. Not me, but you for sure. All right, so from mass measurement to cosmological constraints. All right, so the issues that I want to address in, in this part, theoretical biases in direct mass measurements and their calibration with simulation. What I mean by direct mass measurement? Direct mass measurement means that we have precise enough observations, okay, that allows us to apply some criterion like hydrostatic equilibrium or virial equilibrium or exquisite data on uh, strong and weak lensing, okay, to measure cluster masses. I will touch in particular on hydrostatic masses. I would like to spend a few words about dynamical masses from the Gene's equation, but there is not much in the literature on testing these methods with simulations, okay? So this is something on which whoever of you is keen to do something, this is a an, an relatively open field. Then I will discuss a little bit what observational data and tests on simulations are telling us on the reliability of weak lensing masses. Then I will introduce the concept of a mass proxy. Okay, what is a mass proxy? Since it is difficult to have precise, high quality observational data in a survey mode, meaning for thousands of clusters, what the people, uh, what the attitude of the people is to rely to some observational quantity, which is robustly and precisely related to mass, but which is much easier to measure than uh, then, you know, measuring, for instance, temperature profile, gas density profiles to apply hydrostatic equilibrium, or rather than measuring redshift for thousands of galaxies within a cluster to measure velocity dispersion profile and therefore apply the Gene's equation. So we'll try to see some economic approach to measuring, uh, to measuring masses, which are given by different mass proxies. Then I will tell you what observations are suggesting us uh, on the precision and reliability of mass measurements. Then I will touch upon this point here, which is in principle is something that is overlooked, especially by theorists like me. But it's quite important, the relevance of understanding the, sur the survey selection function. So how we define the volume within which clusters are identified. Never forget that at the end of the day, we want to compare observe and predict the number density. So a number density is a number divided by a volume. So we also have to understand how large is the volume within which we are finding these objects. And then finally, we'll try to overview the, uh, which are the, uh, the state of the art on cosmological constraints derived from galaxy clusters today, in the last year or so. Okay, so masses from hydrostatic equilibrium, okay? Um, this is a picture showing a movie showing a simulation, and the simulation is shown here just to, just to highlight that the formation of a galaxy class is a highly dynamical process. Okay, so it's not something static, so it's not like the Gene's equation in the static, in the time independent, uh, uh, in the time independent approximation, or the, the hydrostatic, the Euler equation uh, set into zero, the acceleration term. Okay, so it's highly dynamical. What this dynamical formation cluster is, is introducing in terms of violation of hydrostatic equilibrium. Well, in simulation, we can address this because we can, 
We can measure density profiles of temperature, gas density, quite precisely. We can apply the equation for hydrostatic equilibrium, derive the mass, and compare with the true mass, okay? And, and see whether the two are discrepant and eventually track back the origin of the discrepancy, okay? So in this plot that I'm showing here, there is, is plotted the difference between the hydrostatic mass and the true mass of a cluster, a relative difference, okay? And you can see that, look at these filled stars. The open stars is something on which I will touch upon later on. These filled stars, as you can see, are quite close to zero, but there is a difference at the level of 10 to 5%, and the difference eventually increases as, as you are moving toward the virial radius. This is not surprising, because as we, we are moving outside in the external region of the cluster, we expect, you know, this dynamical formation of the cluster still be ongoing, and therefore, violation of equilibrium to be more relevant. But for sure, even in the internal part, we should accept that the simulations are suggesting a violation of hydrostatic equilibrium at the level of between 5 and 10 percent. Okay? So this is a general consensus. Somebody is claiming for 20 percent. In fact, if you look at the empty stars, it's more 20 percent. Um, but again, I will touch on this later on. Origin of the bias. Well, origin of the bias are of two main origin. Non-thermal motions generated that generates a non-thermal pressure support. So if we have motions of the gas which are not thermalized, emerging structure, for instance, okay, emerging structure is bringing gas which has a velocity which is clearly non-thermal, okay, which is a bulk motion, okay, of the gas. And this bulk motion can be associated to a non-thermal pressure support in the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium, okay? So, no surprise that if you only use the thermal support, you're going to underestimate the mass. Or, you can also have the acceleration term in the Euler equation not to be completely negligible for the very fact that the cluster is still forming. So, we don't have dv and dt identically equal to zero everywhere in the cluster. All right. In fact, in this nice paper back in 2009, Lau and this group, and uh, the, this is from the group of Andre Kraftsov, what they did is to say, okay, this is the equation for hydrostatic equilibrium in the spherical approximation and in the static approximation. And they said, okay, let's correct this estimator by introducing extra terms due to gas motions. And they divided gas motion into random motions and ordered rotation uh, of the cluster, okay? The thermal pressure support, as usual, is given by, by the gradient of the pressure. Random gas motion can be recasted in this way, using starting from the Gene's equation. So if you take the Gene's equation for a spherical system and you don't impose that, the, uh, and you don't impose anything about uh, zero random motions, okay, you have this expression here, with the velocity dispersion in the radial component, the velocity dispersion in the tangential component, okay? If you even, uh, allow the gas to rotate, you have an extra term, which is much like the mass that you derive from rotation curves in galaxies, okay? The, the square of the tangential velocity times r over g, okay? This would be the mass associated to the rotation of the cluster. And they did this plot in which they say, okay, let's plot here the ratio between the mass associated to each of these components over the total mass, okay, that they measure in simulation, okay? And as you can see, the thermal component is always dominating, as you expect, but it's not identical to one, okay? That would be identical to one if the only support is given by thermal pressure, okay? Random motions are providing instead a non-negligible contribution. Again, if you move to R500, this contribution can be up to 20%, and this would introduce a 20% underestimate of the masses if you estimate the mass using only the assumption of hydrostatic equilibrium. And what they also notice is that if you classify these simulated clusters between relaxed and unrelaxed, you reach the expected conclusion that unrelaxed clusters are characterized by a higher contribution of non-thermal pressure associated to non-thermalized motions of the gas, okay? So this is already, uh, say, from simulation, a proof that um, there is, one has to be careful in applying hydrostatic equilibrium in clusters, okay? So you could apply, but you should bear in mind that most likely you are underestimating a mass by some amount. That depends also on the dynamical status of the cluster. All right, there is also another issue if you use X-ray data, okay? Sorry about talking about problems, but I think problems are those things from which we learn something new, okay? So there is also another issue. 
another issue, the issue is the following. We said thermal bremsstrahlung, okay? From the thermal bremsstrahlung spectrum, we can measure the temperature looking at the position of the cutoff, okay? Or the exponential cutoff in the spectrum. This is fine if we have a plasma which is characterized by a single temperature. Suppose now that you have a plasma characterized by two temperatures, okay? So like in this case, okay, you have one plasma with a lower temperature and a plasma with a higher temperature. The question is, which is the temperature that you would measure by the spectrum given by the combination of these two spectra if you force this spectrum to be fitted by a single temperature model? You understand the problem, okay? We have a thermally complex medium. Each, com uh, each component of this medium has its own single temperature Bremsstrahlung spectrum. The combination of them is not longer a single temperature Bremsstrahlung spectrum. Well, so which is the mistake that I do if I keep forcing myself to fit uh, with a single temperature uh, Bremsstrahlung? Of course, you have also to convolve this spectra with, you know, with the response function of your instrument and so on and so forth. So this issue has been addressed in two papers uh, back uh, more than 10 years ago at this point. Um, so the issue is irrealistic conditions. So with a typical signal to noise uh, that is allowed by observational data and with typical configuration of the detector, meaning the typical energy range within which I can measure a spectrum, meaning from about one kilo electron volt up to say seven or 10 kilo electron volt, Okay, the answer is that what we measure can still be fitted by a single temperature Bremsstrahlung model, okay, but with some bias. Okay, let's try to understand the origin of this bias. So what do we measure in simulation? We can define the temperature in simulation in different ways. The, you know, what we call the electron temperature should be the mass weighted temperature. So each particle carrying its own temperature and we weigh the contribution of each particle by its own mass. Okay, then we integrate over the volume of the cluster. This is the mass weighted temperature, okay? Ideally, this is the temperature entering in the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium. Then we can naively say, okay, but I'm working on X-rays, so what I want to do is not weight the contribution of each gas particle by the mass, but by its emissivity. So gas density squared times the cooling function, which goes like the temperature to the one half for a pure uh, Bremsstrahlung model, okay? And this is another definition. But what it has been demonstrated in these papers, in fact, is that if you have a thermally complex medium, the cold component of, uh, of your plasma, okay, is biasing low your estimate of the temperature, okay, simply because you are increasing the normalization of the spectrum in the low energy part of the spectrum. So when you try to fit with a single temperature model, it's like underestimating the position of the cutoff in the spectrum that you measure. So, it was introduced this concept of spectroscopic light temperature, which is the temperature in which the contribution of each particle is given by a weight, which is gas density squared over temperature to the three-fourth. It's a sort of fitting function, which is more or less justified by analytical arguments if you write down uh, you know, the, 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 the expression of uh, the spectrum contributed by different single temperature Bremsstrahlung models. So this is a proxy for the temperature from spectral fitting, and you understand that weighting in this way, you tend to overweight with respect to this and to this low temperature component of your plasma. So at the end of the day, the spectroscopic light temperature tend to provide a temperature which is slightly lower than the mass weighted or the emission weighted temperature. And this is the temperature, emphasized once again, that you measure from observations. You also understand something. Okay, let me go on and then I will tell you. This is the demonstration of what I was saying now. So this is the typical spectrum, okay, the typical temperature profile in a simulation. This is the emission weighted temperature. The dashed, the dotted line is the profile of the spectroscopic like temperature. Okay, so it's the fitting function with a weight equal to n squared over t, uh, t to the three fourth. And the points uh, is the temperature that you would recover by fitting an artificial spectrum that you generate from the simulated cluster. So you generate a spectrum and you fit the spectrum much like you would do in observational data and you see which is the temperature that you recover. And the answer is that it is much closer 
to the spectroscopic light temperature than to the emission weighted temperature. And in particular, this temperature is below the emission weighted temperature, as we were arguing before. Okay, so this is another bias that one has to keep in mind when using the temperature measuring in X-rays to derive hydrostatic masses. And this is the reason for the difference between empty and open stars. The open stars are exactly like the empty stars, except that I'm using here, they are using here, um, the spectroscopic temperature rather than the mass weighted temperature. Okay, so this adds a further 5-10% bias to the hydrostatic bias. So you have a 5-10% bias induced by valuation of hydrostatic equilibrium and another bias induced by um, this bias in the X-ray temperature. One uh, warning here. The degree of this bias, of course, depends on the complexity, on the thermal complexity of your plasma. If your plasma is very simple, single temperature, then there is no issue. All the temperatures are the same. But if it is thermally complex, then you have this bias. Therefore, calibrating this bias with simulations relies on the assumption that your simulations are providing the correct description of the thermal complexity of the ICM. So a warning again in using simulations for calibrating this effect. All right, we cleansing masses. I assume that Alan Heavens provided you all the formalism on how to uh, uh, get the um, uh, lensing potential from measurement of cosmic shear and convergence. So I assume that more or less that part was covered. And let me just go to the, to the, to the results. This plot here is still based on simulation, then we will move to observational data, is basically a test of the reliability or reconstruction of weak lensing masses from a simulation. So what basically has been done in this paper by Becker and Kraftsoff is they took a cosmological box with a volume of a gigaparsec, they take different clusters, and then they estimate the weak lensing mass by uh, centering a cylinder on the cluster with a given depth of projection, okay? So the depth of projection ranges from few megaparsec out to several hundreds of megaparsec. So you can ask yourself whether the presence of matter in the foreground, correlated matter distribution from the last scale structure in the foreground and in the background of the cluster is inducing some bias in the weak lens in mass measurement and in general, which is this bias in the weak lens in mass measurement? And the answer is that there is a bias in the weak lens in mass measurement, which is of about 5% or so, and this bias is actually almost independent of the depth of the projection, meaning that foreground and background correlated last structure is not contributing much to the bias. The bottom panel instead, what they showed is the scatter in the relationship between mass, the, the uh, sorry, in the relationship between the weak lensing mass and the true mass, okay? So for each cluster, you have a different determination. On average, this is the bias, okay? But there is a scatter, okay? And this scatter instead can increase with the depth of the projection okay, due to the environment, due to the uh, uncorrelated last scale structure which is in the foreground and in the background of each cluster. And not surprisingly, if you classify clusters according to their mass, uh, this effect of increasing the scatter due to projection is larger for lower mass objects, okay, which, has, which are more affected by contamination along the line of sight, okay? So again, this is saying that also weak lensing masses may be affected slightly by um, by some bias in the mass reconstruction, okay? This is mostly, uh, okay, this is what we get. So this is an ideal situation in which there was no convolution with observational effects, okay? Simply a project, the only observational effect is a projection, but there is nothing related to the noise in the source detections and things like that. Then later on, uh, there was an analysis done uh, by Meneghetti et al. and Rassi et al., okay, trying to address this issue, what, in which uh, what has been done basically was to take a cluster, well, take several clusters, in fact, and generate mock images, okay? This is not observational data. This is a mock image of a simulated cluster with background galaxies that was with morphology was generated according to the distribution of morphologies of real galaxies. So 
Massimo, what he did was to populate the background of a cluster with a population of galaxies with typical morphology and to make these galaxies being lensed by the foreground potential provided by a simulated galaxy cluster. In this case, you are introducing some observational effect, like you know, the noise in the, in the recovery of the shear from the shape of realistic, of realistic galaxies and so on and so forth. And this generated and you convolve with typical PSF or real telescopes like Subaru, with a Supreme camera with Subaru or HST, and so on and so forth. Okay? So the idea here is to compare weak lensing masses to X-ray masses, generate mock observations in lensing, and generate mock observations in X-rays. So incorporate the as much as possible observational effects in the analysis of simulations, both for lensing and for X-ray analysis. And this is a typical image of uh, event files, so mock X-ray observations with Chandra of simulated clusters, okay? So this can be done in these days, okay? Uh, it's something that is routinely done. And the answer is in this plot. The answer is in this plot. This quantity Qx is nothing but the ratio between the mass that recovered and the true mass. So one means a perfectly recover, perfect recovery of the true mass of the clusters, okay? So what is shown here is what? So the black is the ratio between the X-ray mass and the true mass. X-ray mass means hydrostatic equilibrium and spectroscopic temperature, okay? So introducing the biases both in the estimate of the hydrostatic mass and in the measurement of the temperature. The green is, oh, sorry, the red is the ratio between the X-ray mass and the true mass using instead just the mass-weighted temperature. So neglecting the biases on the temperature measurements. The green is the ratio between the X-ray mass and the weak lensing masses, okay? So as you can see from this plot, the very fact that this is, that the weak lensing masses are, um, so that the black line is below the green line means that uh, there is, the weak lensing masses are closer to the true mass, but still not there, okay? This is instead the weak lensing mass that we said, the, sorry, the X-ray mass that, not surprisingly, is as a bias of about up to 30% at R500, okay? Which is pretty large. Probably you should wonder whether this answer is correct, i.e. whether the calibration of the biases in the X-ray mass measurement is correct, i.e. whether the simulation is providing the correct description of the thermal complexity of the ICM. Then you go, sorry. That, that's right. Yes, this is, but this is the ratio between, in this case, is the ratio between the X-ray and weak lensing, okay? So this is to say that the X-ray mass, okay, is 10% below the, uh, the weak lensing mass. And since the X-ray mass is 30% below the true mass, then also the weak lensing mass must be some 10 percent below the true mass, okay? Okay, then you may remember this plot that I showed you yesterday, okay? This was the famous tension between the number count of clusters predicted by the Planck CMB uh, and cosmology, and what observed by Planck for, uh, for the Sunezeldovich effect, so the cluster survey of Planck in the Sunezeldovich effect. And we were arguing that, well, the people argue that you need to have a bias in the mass estimate of 40% to reconcile this, uh, this cosmological model here with these red dots here, okay? Um, we demonstrated that you can have a bias up to 30%, but is this the solution? Okay, it's not clear whether this is the solution because it's clear that we have to rely heavily on the assumption that our simulations are providing the correct description of the ICM. Okay, so just to, uh, just to remind you that in fact this plot here to be, I mean, this, this tension here to be, uh, to be washed out requires a pretty strong assumption on the degree of bias in the mass estimates, which is probably uh, not what we have in the real situation. So there may be another problem hidden here. But what, what, X-ray, what uh, observational data are telling us? Okay, rather than comparing weak lens and X-ray masses in, uh, in simulation, let's do it in the data. And there are several papers that have been done in this direction over the last few years. This is from 
uh, uh, from a paper by Anja von der Linden et al., in which they compare the weak lensing masses with X-ray masses based on XMM observations. I will, I will explain why I'm emphasizing also the satellite with which these mass measurements have been done. And what they conclude in the paper that is that X-ray masses are in fact about 30% lower than weak lensing masses on average, okay? Which is a pretty significant effect. But then there was another paper by Donahue et al., um, which they compare weak lensing masses for another set of uh, observed clusters from the CLASH collaboration with X-ray masses based on Chandra, okay, on Chandra observations. And in this case, the X-ray masses are just about 10% below the weak lensing masses. Okay, so it's, it's a much nicer agreement. There is a much nicer agreement between X-ray masses and weak lensing masses. Applegate using a subset of clusters selected from SPT surveys, so in SZ, they also compare weak lensing masses from the same procedure used here, so from von der Linden et al., but instead of using XMM data, they use Chandra data for X-rays, and what they conclude is that X-ray and weak lensing masses are in agreement within 20% or so, okay? Keep in mind that the different weak lens that people here is using different weak lensing mass estimators, well, the weak lensing mass estimator is the same here and here, but it's different from here to here, and especially different X-ray calibrations, okay, different X-ray instruments. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is that in the same paper, Donna you et al. show that the ratio between temperatures of the same set of clusters observed with both XMM and Chandra show a difference. The temperature from XMM in particular tend to be smaller than the temperature from Chandra, okay? And this difference, they notice that disappear if they only use the hard band photons, so from two to seven kV. So this, this is pointing toward the problem of calibration of some of the instrument. And the people tend to believe that there is some issue in the calibration of the XMM detectors. Okay, so for most of you are theorists, so you may be completely not interested in these issues, but this is the kind of problems that you have to understand and face with if you want to do precision cosmology uh, with this kind of approach, okay? Understand in details the nature of the observations, okay? Then we can derive all the cosmological constraints. This is rather simple and even fancy, but, you know, understand the real dirty part of the game is understanding, understanding the data. All right. But in few cases, we do have exquisite quality observations for clusters that are very nicely behaved. This is an example of a cluster, it's max J1206 at ratio of around 0.4. This is what? This is an observation done with, uh, with Subaru. This is HST of the same cluster, so it's a zoom in the, in the central region. There are X-ray observations. There are spectroscopy with VMOS at the VLT to measure hundreds and hundreds of redshifts of galaxies belonging to this cluster. So this is one of those clusters for which we have exquisite lensing data, exquisite spectroscopy to apply the gene equation, and very nice X-ray data. And the people try to recover the mass profiles, and what the people recovered are mass profiles, okay, I can, I can leave you to judge the different mass profiles recovered from different methods that are in very nice agreement with each other. So if the cluster is relaxed and you have very high quality data, then you can really apply all the methods that we described to recover um, mass profiles and they all agree with each other. Meaning that the things are not out of control, simply we need to have high quality data and you know objects which are not crazy, okay? Um, in fact, uh, I will try to see later on, I don't know whether I have time, that this very nice agreement between masses derived from lensing and from non-relativistic tracers of the potential, this can be used to set constraints on deviations from GR at the scale of galaxy clusters, okay? All right, so the issue is that how can we have, of course we cannot have quality of this type for the data in survey mode. It's easy to have for a handful of clusters so the CLASH survey uh, observed 26 clusters, but we can't have, simply there is no possibility to have for thousands of clusters. So this led to the, to the uh, people to, uh, to introduce the concept of a mass proxy. So what is a mass proxy? The definition is the following. 
is simply an observational quantity, which is relatively easy to measure and closely related to mass, phenomenologically and or theoretically. What do I mean by this? First of all, the, the main requirement for a mass proxy is that it should be possible to obtain for a large number of clusters in a survey. The calibration of its relation with mass can be done through observation. So suppose that you have a subset of objects that you observe with high quality data, and you, set a, you use this set of data as a test bed. So as a sort of calibration set in which, that you use to calibrate the relationship between the quantity that is easy to measure and the quantity that is difficult to measure, meaning the mass. Okay? You calibrate this relationship and then you apply this relationship to zillions of clusters for which you have only the quantity that is easy to measure. Or through cosmological simulations, but as usual, the, 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 the question that should be in the back of your mind is whether simulations are the truth. Okay? So the request on the mass proxy, observationally cheap, ideally should be the same quantity on which a survey selection is based. Okay, suppose that we have an SZ survey, okay? So ideally, what we would like to have is that the quantity that defines the completeness of the survey is the Compton Y parameter, because the Compton Y parameter is a very nice mass proxy. Okay, in X-rays, what we have for completeness limit is the X-ray flux. So ideally, we would like that the quantity related to X-ray flux, meaning the X-ray luminosity, once you know the ratio of the cluster, is closely related to the mass. Okay? So ideally, we would like to have a mass proxy, which is also the observational quantity that defines the criterion of completeness in a survey, which is not always the case, which is always never the case. Um, it, it should be precise. Me, what I mean by precise should have a, a small and well-characterized scatter in the scaling relation against, against the cluster mass. Should be robust, meaning insensitive to the uncertainty in our understanding of what is a cluster. Okay? So the scatter should be small, and the normalization of the relation should not suffer by our, uh, our ignorance of what a cluster exactly is. I will make an example of this. Um, I think I will go to skip all this part on the set similar model that may be familiar for some of you. Okay, so X-ray luminosity. X-ray luminosity is an example. Okay, so I showed already this plot showing you that back in 2002, we knew already that the relationship between X-ray luminosity and mass is there, but with a fairly large scatter, around 40%. X-ray luminosity is a pretty tough beast because, you know, since it goes like the square of the gas density, if you modify slightly the, the gas density distribution of your cluster, the luminosity can jump up and down by a fairly large amount, okay? So this is a quantity which is highly sensitive on the details of the distribution of the gas. But what the people understood is that most of this complexity, most of this sensitivity um, of the X-ray luminosity is actually associated to the central part of the cluster. So if, if I excise the central part of the cluster, well, all the mass is happening, feedback from AGN, for example, okay? You pass from this scatter here to this much narrower scatter here, okay? So this is a plot showing the relationship between X-ray luminosity and the, say, mass, okay? This is an X-ray pressure, this is a mass, okay? And the color coding of the symbols is according to whether we are talking about relaxed or unrelaxed clusters. And the relaxed clusters tend to have a fixed mass a higher value of the X-ray luminosity, simply because the, you know, there is more gas at the center. The gas density profiles are spiky in the center. They are the so-called cool core clusters, okay? You excise the central part, and you, uh, you suppress by a large amount the scatter. And this is what makes a, a rather unprecise mass proxy to a rather precise mass proxy, just a matter of excising the central part. Another example is the YSZ. So it's the Compton Y parameter computed within a given aperture through the sunyad zeldovich effect. This is from the first paper from the Pran collaboration on clusters. And this is the relationship between X-ray, uh, sorry, between Compton Y and weak lensing masses. That define a rather tight uh, relationship, okay? There is a scatter, but the scatter is mostly contributed by the errors in the measurement of weak lensing masses and also uncertainties in the measurement of the Compton Y parameter. But, okay, this is how observational data should help in, uh, in calibrating this, uh, 
this relationship. This is inside from simulation, the same relationship between Compton Y and weak lens in mass, but with simulations. And in simulation, you can clearly see that the relation, the simulation symbols are uh, the starts, and the observational data are the points with the error bars. You can clearly see here that simulation and observational data are rather in nice agreement with each other. Okay, the scatter suggested by the simulation is actually very small. Okay, which makes this a precise mass proxy. And it's also a rather robust mass proxy because the different curves from simulations are indicating different physics that I'm introducing in my simulation. For instance, NR means no radiative. There is no cooling, no star formation, nothing. CSF means that there is cooling and star formation and supernova feedback. AGN means that I, uh, you add on the top of this also AGN feedback. Okay? So you are changing the physics of the simulations, but the answer is pretty stable. So this is why we can classify this mass proxy as a precise, small scatter, and robust, quite insensitive to the uncertain physics of the intracluster medium. This is another mass proxy that has been proposed back in 2006 by Andrei Kravtsov, um, which is sort of obvious, but you know, it took uh, Andrei's idea to, to propose this, which is simply the, pro the, um, the product between gas mass and X-ray temperature. Okay, it's similar to the Compton Y. Remember that the Compton Y is the pressure integrated along the line of sight. This is a sort of, how to say, X-ray pressure. Okay, it's the product of a mass of the gas times the temperature. Okay, and also in this case, uh, simulation simulations are indicated here with the circles, and you see that there is a very very small scatter in the relationship between this quantity and the true mass of the cluster. Okay, and the observational data, which are the stars, also show a very small scatter. There is a slight offset between simulations and observations, but the reason of the offset we already know, okay, is due to the fact that observational data rely on masses which are computed from hydrostatic equilibrium, and hydrostatic equilibrium underestimate cluster masses by 10, 20%, which explain this small offset here, okay? Mass in observational data are some 15%, say, below um, the mass in the simulations, okay? So this is another example. In these days, uh, we heard yesterday uh, John Peacock uh, talking about Euclid, talking about the next generation of surveys, and we know that in the next, gen in the next generation of optical or near-infrared surveys, the cluster identification will be done photometrically, okay? Not through the Zeldovich effect, not through X-ray observation, but through measurement through by looking at concentrations of galaxies in photometric redshift, okay? So it's an optical identification. So in, uh, in this, uh, for this identification, the observable that we should rely on to connect with mass cannot be something related to the intracluster medium. It must be something related to the galaxy population. And the most obvious indicator, and the most obvious uh, mass proxy for optical clusters is the richness. This is indicated here with N200, which is the effective, okay, there is a non-trivial definition of richness, but let me call it is the number of galaxies within R200, okay? And then you ask yourself whether the number of galaxies that you count in a cluster, okay, within a given radius, correlate with the mass within the same aperture radius, okay? And the answer is that there is a very nice and tight correlation. This is from observational data, okay? There is a very nice and tight correlation that within the uncertainties in the measurement of the mass and in the determination of the richness is actually consistent with a zero scatter relationship. So with a relationship which, is a, which has a scatter, say, below 10%, okay? So apparently, uh, the richness, if we succeed to measure richness in uh, photometric uh, surveys, is a reliable indicator of the cluster mass. And this is something that we can measure easily. Okay, it's not that something that requires too many efforts. Okay, but let me let me go back. Let me go back to the uh, issue of. Okay, now we are equipped with everything. We know how to calibrate the Helmas function. We know how to measure cluster masses. Um, so let's come back to the issue of what a survey is telling us, okay? It's slightly more complicated than what I told you yesterday. 
So ideally, in a survey to the right cosmological constraints, we want to we want to connect this observable here to this quantity here. Okay, this is the number of clusters in a given interval of an observational quantity that I call lambda. In a given, uh, it's um, in a given interval of an observational property of the cluster that I call lambda. Okay, can be X-ray luminosity optical region, X-ray temperature, whatever, a given observational property, and in a given Rashid beam, okay? So this is given by what? This is given by the convolution, okay? Weighted by the sky coverage, so weighted by the area of the sky that I'm covering with my survey, of this quantity here, which is the number density of objects having a given value of lambda observed and the given value of the true redshift times the volume element at the true redshift of the object multiplied by the probability that an object which is measured with a given redshift zeta zo has a true redshift zt for an object whose observational properties is lambda i. Okay? So here I have troubles in several quantities. I have errors in the measurement of the observational quantity. Okay? So what I observe for lambda may not be the intrinsic quantity. For instance, read optical regions may be contaminated by foreground and background galaxies. Okay. I may have errors in the measurement of the redshift because I rely on photometric redshift most of the time. Okay. And then I have a quantity which should be related to, uh, to uh, theory, so to the uh, mass function, but which is not the mass function, but is the function, the distribution in the observed value of this uh, property of the cluster. I'm circling with red here the quantity that is cosmology dependent, the volume element. Let's characterize these different quantities. Omega or ZT is the service sky coverage, circle in green. This is related to the observation strategy. This is the probability that a cluster with a true ratio ZT and a given value of the observational quantity has a, a, an observed ratio ZO. This is related to observation strategy as well, to the, pre, to the precision of the calibration of the photometric ratio and so on and so forth. This other quantity here is what? Is the convolution of the Helmas function, okay, for clusters at the true ratio ZT with the probability that a cluster with a given observed value of the lambda has a mass m at the true ratio zt. And this is the quantity, the LMS function, entering here, which is cosmology dependent. Not yet done. We have that this quantity here is what? Is the convolution itself between the probability that a cluster with a true let me call it richness lambda t, has an observed richness lambda o, convolved with the probability that a cluster with mass m has a given value of the true richness lambda t. Okay? So these are all pieces that you have to understand and characterize. Again, this quantity here is related to an observational uh, strategy, and it basically is telling you something about projection effects and, and the observational noise. And this quantity here is telling you about astrophysics is the relationship between an intrinsic observational property of the cluster and that its true mass, which is not something that we can directly measure, okay? So this is astrophysics, this is uh, related to the survey, related to the survey, related to the survey, cosmology, cosmology, okay? So all, the th all these things are entering all together, okay? And you have to calibrate each of these parts in a robust way. Uh, let me skip this because it would address the issue that everything is even more complicated and cumbersome. Uh, do you know what is the Malquis bias? How many of you know what is the Malquis bias? Just one, two, three, okay. Okay, sorry guys, I will tell you offline what is the Malquis bias, okay? All right, so cluster cosmologists of today X-ray surveys. This is from a, a recent paper uh, drawn from, uh, which presents the analysis of the XMM XXL survey. The XMM XXL survey is a survey of a contiguous patch of the sky of 
something like 12 square degrees. It's not very wide, but it's actually pretty rich in information. And what they conclude from this analysis is that they derive these contours in the omega matter sigma eight plane, which are pretty wide. And the reason why these contours are pretty wide is not because they have a poor statistics, they have almost 200 clusters, but because they don't control the systematic effect, the selection function, and the relationship between the flux of these clusters and the true mass of the object. So the uncertainties in these quantities is what is making these contours pretty, pretty large. Okay? Drawn in this plot, there is also, uh, you can also see um, kits. So this is a cosmic shear survey from the kits survey, okay, from a survey of galaxies. Okay? And this is Planck. Okay? And this is the famous tension in uh, between uh, Planck and, and, say, probes of cosmic growth from weak lensing, okay? which is a two sigma tension. I don't know whether it's a real tension or not. Uh, people struggling about understanding whether uh, there is some something hidden here, whether this is due to systematics or some unknown physics, and it's not even clear whether the difference is at a high statistical significance. Okay, so uncertainties are pretty large. There is something done more even more recently in a paper uh, by Costanzi et al., where they selected they are preparing for the exploitation of the DES year one survey. What they did basically is to apply all the machinery of the DES year one to SDSS, to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And I expected the results from this year one to be out uh, one of these days. They are not yet out, so we are still waiting for this. Uh, but applying all this machinery to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, they identified 7,000 clusters with a given cluster finder that works in uh, photometric redshifts. And they derived this combination, sigma-8 and omega matter, okay, which is this S8, shown here with these red contours. And again, Planck results are here, okay, and the BAO, so what Alan, um, John Pico was telling you yesterday, is shown here with this vertical line, which constrains omega matter through basically expansion history, okay? S8 is an information that includes growth of perturbation, okay? So that's why BAO are insensitive to S8, because BAO are just an expansion history probe, okay? All right, again, there is a small tension, some tension within Planck and cluster constraints, much like we had between Planck CMB and Planck SZ clusters. This is uh, another recent uh, result. From, this is from SZ, from the Sunyad Zeldovich survey. Especially, this is in particular from SPT survey. And you can see here, you can see here that these are highly complementary. This is optical in the uh, low redshift, and this is Sunyad Zeldovich at the high redshift, okay, with a comparable number of clusters, okay? And the contours here are this. Uh, purple contours here, okay, and the game plank is here, okay, and you may or may not argue whether there is a tension here, and in this paper they also make a plot of, um, of sigma 8 of z, so the change of sigma 8 as a function of redshift, and this is basically a reconstruction of the growth history, and the growth history is shown in, in, uh, in red is basically the plank uh, best uh, fitting model is the Planck concordance model, okay, and this is the behavior expected from GR, okay, and for the clusters, you see that they also the behavior is consistent with the prediction of GR in shape with a slight offset in normalization that reflects just the slight difference between sigma-8 measured by clusters and sigma-8 measured um, inferred from the CMB, okay, extrapolated from the CMB. Okay. Another thing that is worth considering is that this analysis here has been done with about 200 clusters. This analysis here has been done with 7,000 clusters identified in photometric redshift. And still, the contours in size are comparable. And the reason why are they are comparable is because the optical identification introduces a plethora of uncertain calibrations in all the scaling relations that I showed you before that are much better calibrated in Sunyad Zeldovich. Okay? So you can clearly see here the advantage of having a survey that would be both large in statistics and based on observational quantity that, is, that allows us to define 
a selection function in a clear way and which is directly related in a robust way to the mass. Okay? So this is the trade-off between having large statistics and a well-controlled sample. Okay? So here they go for a well-controlled sample, here they go, they go for large statistics. Okay? It would be good to have both, but you know, there is always a price to pay in the life. Okay? All right, I'm left with five minutes. For people interested, I will talk offline about how to constrain GR using mass profiles of clusters. And I prefer to spend a few times to talk about what I didn't talk about. Okay, so it would have taken many more lectures to talk all about all this. All the different ways in which you can use clusters for doing cosmology. So it can be cosmological constraint from the power spectrum, and this is something closely related to the cluster mass, to the hello mass function in, uh, from a theoretical point of view. Measuring cluster masses from CMB lensing, which is, I think, very promising for the future because we are going to have more and more precise CMB observations and looking at the lensing effect produced by cluster identified in the optical band, for instance, or from other survey, and look at the CMB lensing in the direction of those clusters should provide a very nice information on the cluster masses. I mean, the great advantage of having the CMB lensing is that we exactly know the redshift of the sorts, something that we don't know for galaxies, okay? We don't need to have photometric ratio for the last scattering surface. We know where is the last scattering surface, okay? Um, measuring omega matter and the angular diameter distance with the, with the evolution of the baryon mass fraction. Measuring H of Z by combining a Sunet, Zeldovich, and X-ray observations. Measuring the temperature of the CMB with a relativistic SZ signal. Cosmology from the peculiar velocity of clusters, also using the kinetic SZ. Constraints on dark matter nature from strong lensing and clusters, and you may invent several others of these tests. Okay, so there is the real clusters are like, a, you know, it's a gold mine if you want to do cosmological tests. It's not just counting clusters, but it, there is a, a plethora of methods that you can apply to derive cosmological uh, constraints on, on cosmology and dark matter. Future. Future is SPT3G. Okay, so the third generation of the SPT telescope, after SPT poll, uh, they are already taking data with SPT 3G, is going to cover 2,500 square degrees. They have 16,000 receivers, okay, uh, to be compared to the about 1,000 receivers in the first survey on which these first constraints uh, are based. They are covering three frequencies, so in the, uh, in the relic genes part of the spectrum and one frequency for the null or the ASZ. Uh, they expect to detect something like 10,000 clusters to be compared with the 200 clusters, 300 clusters that they have now from the first survey SPT. And they should be able to detect clusters out to Rashi 2 and down to a mass limit of about 10 to the 14 solar masses. Okay? Hirosita. Hirosita is an X ray telescope that should have been launched back in, I don't know, uh, five years ago, maybe. Uh, so next, this in 2019, as far as I understand, September 2019 should be the date, uh, at least as of today, is going to make an all-sky survey with a survey speed which is four times more efficient than XMM, with a point spread function which is 28 arc second for the observational people. This may uh, trigger something which is it's not exceptional. I mean, the PSF is pretty broad. Think about that Chandra at the center of the field of view as a sub second resolution, okay? But this is what we can do in these days. They will anyway detect something like 100,000 of clusters, secure all clusters with a mass above 10 to the 15 solar masses, and again, launch in September 2019. This is what is expected. So SZ, X-ray, and optical. On the optical near-infrared, we have Euclid. This has been described yesterday by John Peacock. So it's a 1.2 mirror, so it's not a big telescope, but it's in space. Optimally optical imaging, okay, for cosmic shear, and two photometric bands in the near infrared to be complemented by bluer bands in the uh, from ground uh, to to measure photometric redshift. Will cover something like 15,000 square degrees, so a good portion of the extragalactic sky to be launched in 2021. 
And this is the cosmology machine, okay? This is really the cosmology machine. It will do cosmology through the cosmic shear, BAO, Rashi space distortions, and galaxy clusters as well, is one of the probes that the, uh, Euclid will be able uh, to carry out. LSST, LSST is ground-based, is 8.5 meter mirror, uh, UGRI uh, ZY photometry, so this is a very, would be a very nice complement for Euclid because it would provide photometry in all the bands that are missing, that are complementing the near infrared band of Euclid. We'll serve 18,000 square degrees of the sky to start in 2022, highly complementary to Euclid with similar and complementary science cases and cosmological probes. So future is really uh, bright for survey cosmology in general and for cluster cosmology in particular. At this point, since the, uh, the seminar is waiting for us, I skip all the description of Euclid, but let me just give you uh, the take-home messages for this third lecture. Uh, I completed the part of the description of cosmological simulation, try to convince you that cosmological simulations are not the truth, but they are useful guidelines to understand clusters, and especially to understand and calibrate mass biases, to assess the precision and robustness of mass proxies. Keep in mind, I never stop claiming and repeating that observational data will tell the final word on this. The fact that simulations, with simulation you can produce very nice pictures, doesn't mean that they are more true than the observational data. Okay? Maybe they are more fancy, but they are not more true. Okay? Um, observational selection is equally crucial. Okay? So if you are a theorist, don't mind making your hand dirty to understand observational data if you want to derive cosmological constraints that are credible, okay? All this under control so far at the level required by current surveys because we have a relatively poor statistics. But the next generation surveys really require a quantum leap in the control of all the systematics. Systematics in the mass calibration, systematic in the control of the hello mass function and so on and so forth. And never forget that, and I want to leave you with this message, that cluster cosmology is much more than just counting clusters, okay? Thank you for your patience. I think we can, I can answer questions during the coffee break or maybe during offline at any time that you want, since we are, ah, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Much for being here. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.